department that have been transferred from other departments that uh, we thought we would go right into that. We also have some out and out new employees to state government who are with us today. And um, so we were kind of thinking out loud, is this the appropriate time from the deputy's point of view? Since so many are here. Then let's, let's do that. And uh, you can see I'm stumbling here a little bit. Yeah, why don't you start? Let's do that because you've got the largest group here, yeah. Susan, and thank you. This is um, page two of the early childhood reports for the day. Um, part of when the governor created the Office of Great Start, he consolidated three, oops, I just forgot. He consolidated three offices into the Office of Great Start. You're very familiar with Lindy's office, the Office of Early Childhood and Family Support. However, two other offices were consolidated in the Office of Great Start, the Office of Child Development and Care, as well as the Head Start State Collaboration Office. Those previously were located within the Department of Human Services, and now all of those employees have moved over to the Michigan Department of Education within the Office of Great Start. And this has been functioning for a while, but today we're going to formally introduce you to all of the staff who have come over from um, the Department of Human Services. First, starting with Jeremy Ruder, who is the head of and the person for the Head Start State Collaboration Office. And I've asked Jeremy to make a couple of comments about his office. Good afternoon, Jeremy Ruder, Director of Head Start Collaboration, and I am a one-man office. So <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Head Start in Michigan is a federal to local program. Head Start and Early Head Start um, in total receive about $250 million in funding to implement a preschool program with comprehensive services for their families, children, uh, birth to age five. In total, it's about 40,000 children, 36,000 age three to age five, and about 4,000 birth to age, um, age three, including pregnant women. Uh, the role of the collaboration office is to serve as a liaison for those grantees across the state with state government, local government, uh, with entities that would support the implementation of those programs, uh, including preschool and those comprehensive services. The additional role of the Head Start Collaboration Office is to support early childhood systems building in connection with K-12, uh, Department of Human Services, Department of Community Health, really ser serving in that liaison role to help connect programs and families to the services that they need in order to um, allow those children move into kindergarten ready for success and allow us to meet the outcomes of the Office of Great Start. And Jeremy is located right outside here, and by the way, has a head start on this himself, given your, your, your child is how old? Two years old. Two years old. So you've you got good practice, Jeremy. <laughs> okay, the next office, which is a little bit bigger, which wouldn't take a whole lot, is um, the Office of Child Care and Development from Lisa Brewer Walhaven. And one of the things I'd like you to note is that part of the reason of making an office a great start is to concentrate on improving the quality of all settings, regardless of where a child is. So you'll see we have child care, we have Head Start, and we have early learning. And the whole job and the whole task of combining everything oops, is so that we can steadily improve the quality and have standards across all of these settings. So Lisa? Good afternoon. I'm Lisa Brewer, Wall Raven, and I am the director of the Child Development and Care Program within the Office of Great Start. And uh, the two primary roles that the Child Development and Care Program has is to ensure that low-income families have access to affordable, quality, early learning and care programs for their children prior to entering school setting while they are working or while they are engaged in training or education activities. And as Susan mentioned, the secondary focus for this program is ensuring that we're improving the quality of those early learning settings. So I am lucky enough to have a wonderful team that I work with, unlike Jeremy, who gets to work with all of us. 
Um, and our office is primarily uh, concentrated in three areas. So our program office really focuses on ensuring that we have guidelines and procedures to meet our federal guidelines and requirements and to ensure that we are um, having children who are in safe settings. So I'm going to have those staff stand and introduce themselves. They won't have a microphone, so I'll ask that they just speak loudly. Hi, I'm Erin Emerson. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Schenkel. Hello, I'm Sally Evans. And I'm Trina Golden. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're... <laughs> Uh, the second area within our office um, is an area that focuses on monitoring the DHS local offices who are determining eligibility for child care. So making sure that documentation is there and that an eligible provider has been chosen. And then helping us identify what training might be needed for those staff to perform those activities. So I'll have those two staff introduce themselves. Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Ames. I'm Amy Lewis. And then our third group who helps us achieve the goals of our office is called the Central Reconciliation Unit. And they are primarily focused on reviewing billings that are submitted by those early learning and care programs to ensure that payments made on behalf of parents are accurate. And they also spend a lot of their time talking with both parents and providers, answering questions about our program. So I'm going to have Evelyn start, but all of that staff can stand up and introduce themselves as well. Good afternoon. I'm Evelyn Oliver. I'm Katie Lamoureux. I'm Tracy House. Is Lisa Jewell? Shadia Bradley. Michelle Judge. Before we do some other introductions, which are folks uh, who are brand new and aren't as a result of transfers, maybe it would, if for a moment, because we're all new to you, we're, I can't tell you how excited we are to have our teams work together now, and I think it's, it's been a, a great move to mm -hmm. consolidate great start in this, in this department. We're very excited to have you as colleagues and uh, uh, really appreciate your taking the time. Some of you are off-site. I'm trying to remember where some of those locations, West Saginaw. And uh, thanks for taking the time to be here. But maybe we should, John, as president, if we'd introduce ourselves too, because these are folks that are new to you. This is the State Board of Education. Uh, John Austin, president. Cassandra Albrecht, vice president. Nancy Danhoff, secretary. Paul Galbinski, 2011-2012 uh, Michigan Teacher of the Year. I'm Greg Tedder. Uh, I work in the Governor's Office of Judicial Policy. Andy Martin, board member. Dan Barner, member from Detroit. Richard Siley, uh, the board's delegate to the National Association of State Boards of Education. Mary Ann Yard McGuire from uh, Detroit and Treasurer. Marilyn Schneider, State Board Executive. Mike Flanagan, State Superintendent. Maybe just some of our colleagues too. <laughs> Why is that I, funny, Marty? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm so shy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Marty Ackley, communications director. I'm Alison Henry, a special assistant to Mike Flanagan. Lisa Hanskinick, legislative director. Susan Broman, and we had our first inaugural Office of Great Start meeting a week ago. So, wow. Yay. Hi, I'm Carol Wallenberg, Deputy Superintendent for Administration and Support. Kelly Vaughn, Deputy Superintendent, Chief Academic Officer. Carol Eastlick, Senior Policy Advisor. Abby Groff, Senior Policy Advisor. Uh, Kyle Groff, Director of Office of School Support Services. I'm Jeff Sikia. <laughs> <laughs> She's waiting for Sarah. I know. We're trying to hire her. <laughs> Don't tell David. Okay. You tell me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're ready. I know. You've been it. We're looking. 
And then we have a few other folks which in the tradition we've started, the board asked and started recently, who are, all of these are virtually all federally funded folks, um, especially the ones we're ready to introduce also. Um, and if you'd, you'd stand and at the end we're going to give, well, maybe the, I think we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have you stand and introduce who you are. Um, so why don't we just start that? Why don't Jennifer Robel, if you would start, please. I'm Jennifer Robel. I'm a departmental analyst in the superintendent's office. And Janice Selberg. Good afternoon. I'm Janice Selberg. I am a new employee in the Library of Michigan in the Law Library. Please, and each of you, if you would. I know you've joined us in the... Good afternoon. I'm Laura Goldplay. I'm an early on consultant in the Office of Great Start Early Childhood Education and Family Services. Good afternoon. I'm Kelly Hershey, um, a colleague of Laura's, hired at the same time, early on consultant, Office of Great Start Early Childhood Education and Family Services. It's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sarah Holman. I work in the Office of School Support Services as a program analyst. And I'm Joanne Newroth. I'm back. I knew some of you in an earlier incarnation yeah. at the department, <laughs> but I'm working now with Linda Forward at the School Improvement Support. Let's welcome them all. Thanks so much. And you're, you're certainly welcome to stay and see how sausage is made, if you'd like, <laughs> but you're also welcome to, to leave as you see fit. And um, we're going to go right into our public participation so that our guests uh, appreciate your indulgence to let us introduce some of our new folks. They're not staying. Is it something we... <laughs> All right. So, Mertz, please. I currently have three forms for public participation. You are reminded that you will have five minutes to address the board, and the board does not respond to questions at this time. They may respond at a later date as deemed appropriate. So the um, first person to the table is Ruth Zweifler. Rod Mott. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rod Monson, the field director for the ACLU of Michigan. Uh, I just wanted to um, applaud the board for taking up for discussion um, some items dealing with zero tolerance and alternative discipline strategies. We had an opportunity to come and talk to you all last fall about um, issues connected to the school to prison pipeline phenomena. Um, and I am glad to see that this is now uh, on your agenda. Um, I had an opportunity to sit through quite a bit of this meeting today, and one of the things that struck me is the fact that you know, while we look at testing and you know, things like advanced placement when it comes to student achievement, we don't often look at discipline as part of that equation, and I think it's important um, because, as you all know, we, we can't educate children if they're not in school. So um, I urge the board to um, Consider this for uh, endorsement and uh, strongly urge our districts across the state to rethink the ways in which they are disciplining our students so that they have an opportunity to graduate. That's it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Our next speakers are coming to the table together. They are Barbara Markle and Vanessa Gary. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, we believe that we come with two things. First, um, an explanation of the importance that we are placing in our programming on African American males and their ability to learn uh, through effective instruction. And my colleague is going to talk a little bit about a gentleman we're bringing in, uh, Dr. Alfred Tatum, who will be coming to two conferences that we are holding this summer as the uh, <laughs> last sessions of our Michigan uh, Fellowship for Instructional Leaders. Uh, this is a program that's been going on for about three years. We are, that, we are sunsetting that program 
as we are looking at other ways of um, meeting the needs of high priority schools. Uh, however, in the work that we have been doing, we know that um, uh, students, all students need in effective instruction. But some we reach better than others, and so we're very pleased to invite the um, to invite all of you to actually a choice of two conferences. One um, we are holding on June 15th. I, I'm sorry, June 25th at 10 a.m., which is Monday. It's the opening session of our we call this our My Phil conference. Um, and it, we are currently serving 26 uh, high priority schools. Half of them will be at this conference, so that's one option for you. And the second will be on July 9th, um, again a Monday, 10 a.m. It will be our opening session with Dr. Tatum. And I would like to um, turn this over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Vanessa Gary who has come to us from St. Louis and uh, has joined us for her first full year and I hope she's with us for many more years. Her area of expertise um, is not only in school reform but in, um, but in literacy and um, I think that Dr. Tatum uh, it will bring us um, a great deal of, ex will increase our expertise in how we work with African American males and develop their reading. I'll turn it over to Vanessa to let you know why. Thanks, Barbara. Um, first of all, I wanted to just tell you very quickly that MSU recently had a symposium uh, for African American males. And what that means is they invited probably about um, six districts to uh, bring African um, American males into the College of Education and just um, listen to their voices. And I'm going to tell you what some of them said because they really um, um, made me listen to what they said and how that connects to our work. So this meeting with the young men lasted probably for about two or three hours. They had adults in the room with them and adults from some of the districts. So it took a lot of courage to be straightforward. So some of the things they shared um, included things like, um, we give teachers back to them what they ask of us. That made me ponder. Another student said, I am on um, the basketball team and um, I like sports and most kids like sports. But what I don't get is the grade point average that's required to play is 2.5. It should be higher. Another student said, I, I get in trouble with my math teacher because he doesn't really explain things to me really well. And um, I, so I go next door to get help from the math teacher. Then he writes me up and sends me to the office. These were telling things that uh, young African American males were telling adults that they live every day. But what they told me that day was, we want, we want a lot. We want to be looked at differently. We want to achieve and we want people to believe in in us. And so as Dr. Markle shared, we're going to bring Dr. Alfred Tatum um, in to visit with our schools. Dr. Alfred Tatum comes from University of Illinois out of Chicago. Uh, deep experience, started as a, a middle school English teacher, was, um, is, um, was and still is a literacy coach, um, heads up the institute, the Literacy Institute at the University of Illinois in Chicago and has published lots of work um, from um, Harvard Review to his own um, books. And so he is an expert in his field and he brings um, compelling information to us. Um, does that mean that I stop? You get 10 okay. actually. All right, with All right. sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, so w what I want to share with you, I want to situate those voices into what um, is a framework for some of Dr. Tatum's work. Dr. Tatum says that as educators, we should listen to the voices of African American males, give them an opportunity to be heard. And uh, from the comments that I mentioned to you earlier, that kind of rekindles that kind of thinking. We give to teachers what they ask of us. They are asking for more. Another thing that Dr. Tatum work invites us to do is to take pause. Before we send a rambunctious student out 
for whatever reason because of immaturity. Uh, we should take pause on that and rethink that before we're so quick to do it. And you heard that come from the young man who said, I get in trouble when I ask the teacher next door for help. And then the last thing that he invites us to do is to use literacy, to, to aim wide and use literacy as a way to move these youngsters forward. And he invites us to do that by giving these young men a sense of purpose. And I say that with such excitement because we as educators, we've got a repertoire of literacy strategies to help these young men move their lives forward. So as Barbara mentioned earlier, I hope that all of you come to listen to his message and um, be shoulder to shoulder with all the educators in the, the room so that we can listen um, actively and embrace some of those things that we know um, work and use them in the fall so we can help um, move um, the needle for a lot of these kids who are waiting for that to happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's going to be at the Eagle Eye Conference Center at Eagle Eye Golf Course, which is located on Chandler Road, East Lansing, or Bath. We'll get you any follow-up. We, we will our, send the, um, we'll send you the, we'll get that. Uh, all of the information. And while well, he is starting at um, 10 o'clock, we invite you to stay actually as long as you like. and and meet with the schools and we have done an impact study of these schools and know that many of them have made a difference throughout um, the past couple of years as they have as they have focused on um, school improvement but this is one important component that we feel we will need to continue so thank you thank, thank you. you very much thank you and if you're still around, you'll see how timely it is because the board and department goals have one very specifically focusing on um, African-American males. So I appreciate your comments today especially. Thank you. Thanks for hosting the Ed Alliance yesterday too, Barb. <laughs> Is that, oh, that, that? Oh, okay. yeah. Good. Right. John, President's Report. I just wanted to note and thank um, colleagues for a couple of the things, several of which we worked on considerably at the, our retreat together. Um, the goals and priorities for next year <coughs> we'll talk about briefly and I know a couple colleagues had just some uh, fine tuning or wanted to, a little wordsmithing so but I was generally very pleased and appreciate the setup and the framework you guys and Mike and your team put together for that set of um, sure. priorities and also wanted to note, not noted as we look ahead is um, what we were able to accomplish. I mean, there's things that got checked off uh, that in, often in collaboration with the governor and the legislature, you know, we made as priorities um, that we are moving ahead with. So uh, I wanted to note that. I also wanted to um, appreciate and note the study on education finance innovation that we spent some time on the retreat, that we have a good scope of how we would like to develop and promote a forward-looking vision and needed roadmap for how we finance in Michigan the innovative, equitable, high-quality education of the future. And we are proceeding with that work uh, in consultation as we talked with uh, representatives of the legislature last time and with uh, the governor's office and engaging with the funder community to get that independent um, beginning started for that work. So I appreciate my colleagues' uh, collaboration on that. And I also very much appreciate the uh, efforts to help the legislature make a good decision about the high school requirements. Um, Nancy. Uh, Eileen testifying um, at the House Committee. Um, we are needing to continue to help um, uh, educate and encourage that we are not interested and we need, again, continued help to engage the business community and the administration to be on the same page about we're not uh, wanting to, we do want to meet the needs for the jobs and occupations that employers have and aren't seeing filled today. We do want to prepare our young people um, and our adults very well for rewarding careers where they can earn a living in the future, but that in no way, shape, or form uh, is uh, returning to the VOCAD system of days of yore. It is really about having more people involved in what Paul described and what he showed and what we've seen at his shop and others, the Career Technical Education 2.0, or maybe we're at 3.0, 
where you're learning the rigorous academic content and you're learning it in real world context so that you can be the CAD designer, you can be the IT software engineer, you can be the chemical engineer, you can be the medical technologist or the physician. And you need high-end math, you certainly need uh, global um, fluency and cultural awareness, uh, whether you're going into work or whether you're going into um, uh, post-secondary technical uh, credentialing or uh, college opportunities. And so we need to continue to um, help illustrate that. And I just wanted to, I don't, did others receive this package from Achieve that was recent around? If you look through that, there's some great um, uh, examples, which I think are going to be very consistent. You know, we did talk more, many of us with MEDC, uh, who are doing some uh, talent intelligence work. What are the real jobs that are needed in Michigan from our employers? That's going to be happening over the summer. And I think it is going to begin to illustrate uh, where employers have needs for uh, the kind of career uh, and high-end occupations that do require uh, the same rigorous math, certainly, uh, and that can reinforce the argument that what the work world needs and what um, our, uh, our higher education next step uh, preparation needs are the kind of rigor that we're, we want to keep in, in the Michigan merit. But just a couple of these facts from the Achieve, I just wanted to uh, read into the record, I guess, just as, and I think, our Michigan employers are going to tell us the same thing. Um, the growth in math intensive science and engineering jobs is outpacing overall job growth by three to one. We're seeing those kinds of jobs are what we really need. Um, simply taking advanced math, simply taking the rigorous math has a direct impact on future earnings apart from anything else. Students who take advanced math have higher incomes 10 years after graduating whether or not they got a college degree, whether, no matter what their background or what their grades, just taking it leads to higher earnings. Even many blue collar jobs now require advanced math. The math skills required by electricians, construction workers, upholsterers, and plumbers match what's necessary to do well in college courses, community college, university preparation. The IBEW Brotherhood of Electrical Workers created a test for prospective apprentices that includes algebra. Uh, among high school graduates who entered the job market directly, you know, we're arguing most need some technical post-secondary education. But those who went right into the job market, 68% of those who took Algebra 2 or higher felt they were well prepared for the math they were needed to do at work. Only 45% of those who did not take Algebra 2 or higher felt that they were prepared. Uh, and half regretted not taking more challenging math courses in high school, of those who entered the job market directly. Uh, three quarters of all adults who are in the top quarter of uh, paying pain of jobs took Algebra 2. So, you're going to do better in the long run with math. And probably a fundamental argument that sometimes gets lost is higher level mathematics equips students with the critical thinking and analytic skills as well as the adaptability and flexibility. People are going to change jobs 11, 12, 13 times. Taking rigorous content, as you know, John Covington's presentation today uh, illustrated, you need to have young people develop the navigational skills, the critical thinking skills, the ability to, to uh, identify what they need to learn and how they can engage with it. That's more important than the content, and that's what you learn by taking rigorous, challenging math uh, and the kind of things we're asking. So I just wanted to reinforce and thank my colleagues for um, working hard, and we'll need to continue to work hard to um, help us see the educational future of, of the education system of the future, which we talked a lot about the re at the retreat, and it is multiple paths to a effective way to prepare yourself for satisfying and creative work and careers. So I appreciate everybody's hard work on that. Thanks, John. In addition to what Nancy and Eileen did, I want to thank you for your leadership in trying to coordinate some of this. I thought um, particularly your email to parties, some, some of them I wouldn't have thought of, was really helpful. It gave us a chance to respond to that, reply to all pretty quickly. And I think engage this pretty broad net of MEDC and Studley and other, sometimes they uh, right. and, triggered and, something. And you know, business leaders from Michigan um, has HR directors who I think will be willing to say more of the same thing. But as you know, Greg, they're going to want to um, be in sync with, uh, are we in a common page here with the administration on what is the articulation of the uh, the standards and learning competencies that we all want to see. So we'll need to continue to try to um, get on that same page, but appreciate that. And I think the governor's been solid on this. Appreciate his continued support of holding the MMC together, and uh, I think all of us need to work as a team. 
I would, I, as for my report, uh, the main part was going to be the new employees. We've kind of jumped the gun on that. We'll do that each time in that in our report. But I thought I would um, highlight a couple of things. I had a chance to be on the panel uh, at the state symposium on the African American male. I was asked to be part of a panel, and uh, I wasn't there the the whole day. But you could just see it was pre our retreat, and the coincidence of that in terms of our focus on what Deb was able to show, the data is very clear about where our, our greatest challenges are, I think is really going to reinforce our item today on board goals for the year. Um, and then it was, if you had, haven't had a chance, I visited Clintondale. Uh, Clintondale uh, was a PLA school. It's flipped its classroom. It's, it's just exciting to see teachers and students Energized. I think this re-energized them, and the, 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 the teachers in particular, it was really, I could tell, heartfelt on their part that they were a little, you know, they, they had to get over the labeling, which we all have to in the beginning. These are federal terms that are, you know, that are painful, persistently lowest achieving when you've dedicated your life to doing what they do. And, but I thought what was more noble was the fact that they've just stepped up and they said, we're going to do things differently and we're going to get out of this. And the kids were enthusiastic about it and the teachers were. And I, I would recommend a visit there if you have a chance. If you're even in the neighborhood, I'm sure they'd entertain you. And it's very exciting. Um, uh, as you know, got to. Uh, to surprise Bobby Joe Kenyon, and uh, I think she's, as always, our gracious teacher of the year. Paul was very uh, gracious in talking to her even prior to this meeting, and I think has set her up for what's going to be a very good year. I do think it really is a nice kind of happenstance that um, she represents a school that has challenges that most of our 4,000 schools don't. And while we're making some of these tough decisions, I think it's going to be able to really represent that well. It's just perfect timing. Paul was perfect timing this year. You'd think we orchestrated this somehow, and it was just. Um, and then uh, Michigan School for the Deaf graduation last week. Uh, our family gives a little scholarship out there, so I was there just in that role, really. Uh, but I, I would tell you that when we have the date, and they don't have one yet for their grand opening of the new building, just driving around the backside to get to that event because there's a lot of construction. It's it's just fantastic. And when you think that our kids are going to have this opportunity in a brand new building that without state appropriations the last number of years, the other one was just falling apart, literally, and not safe. So it's just, a, it's just fantastic to see they're going to have an appropriate place for them. And then, uh, so I think it's July 1, literally. Uh, of course, kids will be out of school by then, but that building is going to be raised, the old building, and then the new one in effect. So sometime in July, and when we get a date, we'll pass it on to you. I think you'd be excited to go to the, uh, the grand opening or whatever they call it. And finally, um, I know you probably have seen already, and if not, I, I recommend it to you, the, the Ed Connection newsletter, which Marty and his team put together. We've reformatted that a little bit, but I, I, we're really trying to emphasize um, teachers. And if you'll notice, the opening article is written by a teacher, and it's one that we stumbled on in my Holland visit, who was a, who was a veteran teacher who uh, was asked to pilot kind of, it's incidental that it happened to be the iPad because it'll be something else two years from now, but it cho totally changed the way she delivers her instruction. She would never go back, and, and so what we're trying to do through these articles and in other ways is is what a number of you spoke to this morning. I mean, it, it is hard, even with well-intentioned reforms, it's hard not to feel demoralized, all of us, just starting with the state soup, like you're just not good enough. You know, the, the, you know, when I see this Exxon ad that we're 25th in the world and all that, I certainly feel a, a tinge of, uh, I'm not sure how I'd describe it. I mean, somewhat embarrassment in one sense. On the other hand, hey, we're doing the best we can, you know, and it's so, and, and I'm the state superintendent. So imagine if you're a new teacher with 180 kids and you're trying to make this work, it can just feel like it's a continual pounding. And uh, so, and maybe in some quarters it is a pounding, but from us it's not. And we're going to look for every way and open any suggestions you might have on how to make sure that we're honoring this hard work because Frankly, even if you're cynical, and I know no one is here, but and thinks we don't have the best in the classroom that we could, and we really do, but even if you're cynical, 
we're not going to get people to come to this profession if they feel like it's a constant pounding. So this is something I think in all of our interest. I had a chance recently to be on a panel at the Mackinac Center. I uh, made that point. I think it was well received. And because we're, 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 we're almost in inventing our own future inadvertently of not getting uh, the best and the brightest if we, if we don't honor the profession. So there's a, a balance between accountability which we need to have, and yet on the other hand, honoring the hard work. And we're going to try to do that more and more and would be more and very open to any other suggestions you have. Um, I think one great way we have that you've started long before I was here was having the Teacher of the Year sit at the table. It just, it just shows the, the, you know, the, the strength and uh, excellence that the profession has. And then I've asked Sally to sit for a moment and give us uh, kind of a, I don't know if there, there might have even been a morning update on the, on the ESEA flex application. We were hoping that call would amount, I'm not privy to any, did the call happen first of all, I don't. Yes, we did have another phone call with the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, they've given us a specific contact person and a team, so whenever we have questions, we can just call them up, set up a meeting, and they're very, very quick to respond to us. I think at the last board meeting I indicated that they had uh, mostly questions just needing some additional clarification, so we continue to refine the document so it's very clear exactly what we plan to do. Uh, particularly for the new kinds of schools that are going to be announced. Uh, the, the persistently low achieving will now become priority schools. They've added a second group called focus schools, which will deal with the achievement gaps. And then the third is are the reward schools, which are schools that are doing better than uh, expected or progressing faster. Um, so we continue to do those. The, the, there were two issues. Well, focus. Uh, one of the outstanding issues until this morning was the graduation rate, which we included as a, at a 10 percent rate in our, in our in our formula and our format. Uh, we came up with an alternative way to deal with the graduation rate. They thought that was a little bit too low, and we told them we were really concerned about you can graduate students, but if they can't read, then they really shouldn't be getting a diploma. So I think we've re as of this morning, I think we've reached consensus on uh, on a way that meets what their needs are and also uh, reflects what our needs are. The most outstanding issue has to do with the educator evaluations because of the timeline in the ESEA flexibility. The, they are proposing that we lay out what our statewide guidelines are and then pilot for a year. Michigan is actually doing exactly the reverse. Uh, you may remember that the Michigan Council for the Educator Effectiveness announced in their interim report in April that they want to do a pilot this next school year. Now keep in mind that Michigan is already a year ahead of where the feds are going because it was this school year that all educators had to be evaluated with student growth as a significant factor. Next year they have to be evaluated again with their locally developed evaluation, again with uh, student growth as a significant factor. <coughs> but at the same time, uh, based on what the council has recommended, that they will do a pilot, I think they said in about 12 school districts, and they will pilot a couple of different observation tools, they'll pilot a couple of different ways of dealing with student growth, and then they will make the determination of what the statewide guidelines are. So we're doing the pilot first and then determine our statewide guidelines. The feds have their timeline where you develop the guidelines first and then pilot them. The good news is we, all, we reach the same uh, outcome, but not until, I guess, 20, 2014 and 2015, that's when the feds are expecting full implementation of the state, of the state um, guidelines for the evaluation. So we're at a disconnect for two years, but then eventually we all end up at the same place. Uh, there are a couple of other states that are in a similar situation, and I've been very, very impressed with their willingness to work with us on that. Uh, we had a very good conversation with Carmel Martin, who's the Assistant Secretary for the United States Department of Ed, and she said uh, she thinks that we can get to yes on this, and so she's going to continue to work with us to figure out um, how, to, how to deal with the timeline. But like I said, I think we're okay because the end is, is, is aligned. It's just we're a little bit unaligned with where they are, and I think gonna be some, there's going to be some flexibility on that. And when, as you know, when Sally says we're not aligned, it's the, it's the quirks in the way the law was laid out and the council and all the rest. Uh, it, it, it's good to hear, even for me it's the first time to, to hear her confidence that we'll get to yes, Carmel's. Did any timeline thinking on her part or is that more? 
Um, they're, they're approving these, they call them waves. So uh, you know that they did announce eight states about a week or two ago, and there are a number of states that are still doing what we're doing, which is getting additional clarification and ha having ongoing phone conversations and meetings. They really haven't given us a timeline. Board members, any comments or questions? Can you share what the graduation rate compromise is? Oh, I knew you'd ask me that. Um, We'd need probably Vanessa up here to explain it really well. Can wasn't it, didn't we anticipate they were pushing us closer to 16 or 17 or something? Yeah, the, like that the, the state. To give you a sense. Yeah, so we would be moving basically from 10% up to uh, over 16%. And that's what they were really pushing us for. They didn't really want us to be any lower than right around 17, and we're very, very close to 17%. So that's the. the we're close to 17%. In terms of what as far as county graduation with rate. the feds, they wanted something closer to 17 percent, and apparently, because we, we talked about it Friday at some length, and there's a kind of a mechanical way to get to that. That, but the bottom line is it would be something approximating 17 percent, right. and they apparently. It's it's part of a, without having all the formula, it's part of the formula for how we include what percentage we include to count graduation rate when we come up with a scorecard? For the graduation rate, it's the graduation counts, graduation rate counts as 17% as part of our scorecard. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. We're good. We don't want to go into the money. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. It, it was 10 because the blend the blend was thinking earlier and you know they pushed us but the thinking was if any problem that we might have to some degree is we've got as you heard this morning some diplomas that are given out to kids where zero percent of them are proficient in math zero so we were trying to temper that but they feel that it and I think they're probably right. You know, they've got experience on a national level, so they've pushed it more to 17 or 16.9 or something. Right. So it was similar to what we discussed Friday, apparently. Right. right. Which is good. You know, this is good news, and this is why you work with them. And they, uh, I, I wouldn't even call them partners. I mean, they're the ones that decide the waiver or not at the end. But they've actually been operating as partners more than. Uh, and we've still got a, a little bit of a concern, but it's nothing that we really got control over at this point. They. They did mention that they did not see anything in the Michigan legislation that gives MDE any authority to monitor for compliance with the ed evaluation um, or the ed effectiveness uh, law. And also, um, it's not clear if a district is not compliant with doing the educator evaluations and what happens. So those are still questions that are out there, but those are not things that are within our control. Yeah. And I mean, we'll just keep you updated, including between meetings, if it turns out that we don't get approved because of one of those things, then uh, we need to, I don't know what we need to do. You know, there, there's legislative issues that maybe are inherent in that. We're moving along, though. Good? Yep. Thanks, Ellen. And Cassandra, I know Muskegon Heights. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to just kind of get an update on where we are with Muskegon Heights because for several weeks, um, it had been reported in the media quite extensively, and then it, I haven't seen anything lately, so I wasn't sure if A, there was an update, but B, I also wanted to just share some concerns that I have, and you and I had a brief conversation about this, um, but kind of get it out there, because some of what we had talked about, I didn't see reported anywhere, so I just wanted to kind of have a conversation about that as well. So I don't know. Please. What? Um, just go ahead. Okay. Sure. So when it was reported about uh, what was the idea in Muskegon Heights, um, it kind of indicated that there would be two districts set up. Um, the original district would maintain, and that would maintain all of the debt, and then all of the schools and the students, and essentially a whole new district would be created, which would be a charter school. And so my question had been, how do you have a district that maintains all of the debt but doesn't have any income? And what I subsequently learned, and I'm, you know, if this is in fact accurate, is that uh, that district will continue to levy local property taxes, and that's how they will pay off the debt, while the 
schools themselves will become charter schools. And so my question really has to do around with, you know, state law indicates that charter schools cannot levy local property taxes. So this seems to be an end run around the spirit, if not the letter of the law. And I'm, I'm concerned that it's becoming a pilot project for other districts that find themselves in debt to take on the same structure, if you will. Um, and it's just, it's something that's a, a, a concern of mine. I'm not sure the legalities, I mean, I'm clearly attorneys have been reviewing this, I'm sure, but if I were a taxpayer in Muskegon Heights, I think I would certainly be questioning why I'm still paying local property taxes when my schools are now charter schools outside of uh, the control of my publicly elected board. So those are essentially my concerns, and if anyone has any answers, I would welcome them and appreciate them. Well, um, first of all, I don't have any definitive answers because, as you know from our conversation, it's not in our purview, but we've been, we've been privy to some of this in terms of listening in, Carol has, with some of Treasury. And, um, you know, our, our, as you know, our position stops when we recommend to the governor that he put a review team into a district, which we did in the case of Muskegon Heights. Now remember, Muskegon Heights board requested an emergency manager, so this is even a more unique kind of variation of what you're saying. It's interesting that I, I, I think your point is really well taken in a district that had no desire to find themselves in an emergency manager situation. It's ironic that this board actually, that board actually asked for one. And then we still went through all the process anyway and uh, recommended to the governor. He had a review team. It ended up being that as the board requested, the local board of education requested, they have an emergency manager. Once they have an emergency manager, as you could kind of hear from these other situations, they have under the current law, which is being, you know, being uh, uh, challenged, or will be eventually, if it, no matter what happens in the courts, they'll be, um, he, in this case it's Don Weatherspoon, has some authorities that regular boards and the rest of us don't. Um, just as an aside, I would say, just to show our role, it's in contrast to Pontiac, which we think, and I, in the final analysis, it's up to the state superintendent, think that they made tremendous progress, so we didn't recommend a review team to the, to the, to the governor. So there's a bit of a check and balance. If we don't recommend a review team, even if the governor thinks there should be an emergency manager, he can't proceed. Uh, and I don't think he thought that, by the way. I'm just saying it's a bit of a check and balance. We would have to get it started, and then even if we thought we passed it on to the governor. The reason this is relevant to Muskegon Heights is only to just say for clarity that I think these are very important questions. We have some of them ourselves. Um, it, it potentially seems as it could open Pandora's box, but I don't want to, you know, I don't know if Greg has something to offer. I, I, I do know that you're right to say there's been all kinds of attorneys involved. Um, I don't know if there'd be a challenge here because of the nature of the Muskegon Heights request, um, but again, I don't, I don't know. Carol, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that. You've been involved with Treasury to some degree. Well, I think, I think you've covered all the relevant points. It's, it's clearly once, once the review team leaves, and we have had discussions here um, about it. I don't know if Greg has anything more to add, but we're watching to make sure that our piece is done correctly. Uh, we do have some control uh, in Sally's area over um, charter schools as far as reviewing applications and, and Mike has to issue a, a school code. But again, that's very prescriptive. Um, we do it all the time. So um, the attorneys have been involved and um, we've done our part, but the rest of the decisions are outside of our control. Yeah, I, would, I, I think a lot of the issues are more appropriate for Treasury, but I would say that um, Don, Dr. Weatherspoon is required under PA4 to submit a financial and operating plan to the Department of Treasury to be approved by the state treasurer that provides for uh, an education of the system, for an education of the kids that live in the uh, city of Muskegon Heights. So he made that public. You can pull it up right now. It's on the Muskegon Heights webpage. Um, and as an emergency manager, He's determined that this is the only way schools can continue to operate in the city of Muskegon Heights. So I think that it's a unique situation, and I, I don't think you're going to see this become widespread or this become the norm. I, I would add that there is a, 
um, on, on terms of the local mills, uh, you've got the you've got debt, local debt that needs to be paid off, and I don't know where else it can go. I don't think you're advocating that we go down the slope of having the state bail out school districts or insolvent cities. But I would add that they do benefit in some ways because the, as you know, the foundational, foundation allowance is made up of a local millage and then the state meets the rest. So in the case of these charter schools, they'll get an entire state aid. They'll get a foundation allowance that's made up entirely of state aid. So uh, I think that I don't think that these children are going to be hindered by the debt that's left behind. I think, in a lot of ways, the best way to think of it is sort of, uh, I don't want you to think that there's two different school districts in Muskegon. Don is, is going to be the charter school authorizer. He's got a board that he's going to appoint. And that board is going to be responsible for the oversight of the charter school system. So um, they're attached. He's the authorizer. He's responsible for them and their quality. So I don't you think that there's no there's no outside entity coming in chartering schools. He's still responsible for the education of the school district. So that might clarify some things. I want to get in. And if I may, I think this. when I mentioned Pandora's box, the issue from our point of view at at first was kind of what you're saying, Greg. That there's more money flowing into Muskegon Heights now than there would have been under the traditional plan to because they're extent. keeping their 18 mills to pay off the deficit and they're getting a full FTE for the, district, for the charter district. Whereas before it would have just been the full FTE and out of that you have to start paying off your debt. So there's a certain irony here that, that that's the part I meant about, well, I'm not sure if I was a local superintendent with a deficit that I wouldn't be thinking about. Uh, exactly. But you won't be able to do that unless... I don't think you, I don't think local superintendents are going to think about shutting down their school. I don't think that's a platform for. Like well, that. you know, and I don't mean even as a criticism. I just meant that in a way, the irony is for the kids of Muskegon Heights. Again, it's a, it's a little bit interesting that interesting. I'll leave it at that. Not appropriate or inappropriate that the board determined they wanted a financial manager. That was shocking to us when we first received that note notice. But the interesting part is there's more resources going into that state, uh, into that district for each of those kids than there was under the traditional plan because of the way the 18 mills is being used separately for the paying off the debt. And then they're going to get a FTE, as I said, for each kid that comes in as the charter. And um, so, I mean, if, if we're doing the student focus thing in some respects, this isn't pro or con charter. This is just the idea that there's actually more resources behind each of those kids, ironically, under this, mm -hmm. under this financing. I think, I think Cassandra wanted to follow up, and then no, Dan. No, I'll, I'll wait for others. Okay, Kathleen, and then Dan. Well, first of all, I'm really glad to say this. I have to put this on the agenda, because I have the same concern about the financing of the No, that's why I'm saying it's. How come there's more money instead of paying off the debt? How come there's money? How come if they're getting the, the foundation grant, if, if it went to the district, they would get the foundation grant too if they still have the kids. Right. So why is there more money for the, for the students? Well, there's more money because the local 18 used to be just a part of the total FTE. It would be the local 18 plus the state contribution would make up the FTE under yeah. Muskegon Heights. Now that 18 is being dedicated strictly to paying off their deficit. Not their bond debt, by the way. That's a whole different ball game as we mix up once in a while. The bonded debt that they may or may not have is, is done by millage that's voted in 20, 30 years ago. But the deficit issue that we have a responsibility through Carol's work to, to, to be on top of, it's actually ironically from our point of view kind of remedied easier because we don't have to in effect insist that very tough decisions be made in the educational program because this stream of money is going to start to take the deficit down. That 18 is separate from the FTE. And uh, 
This isn't. We know, but Carol, welcome to say they, what you do. They know. had to do a request for proposal, a, a bid process, and as I understand it, they had two bids come in, and so they'll choose between those two um, companies to run the district. And I, I don't know if it's going to be one or both of them. Um, that will be up to, to Dr. Weatherspoon. Oh. So we don't know if it's a nonprofit or a for-profit company or anything. We, we know that, that there are large charter school operators, and so we know that there were two who submitted a bid. One is Leona, and one is Mosaica. So they had, they had to meet very strict parameters for um, the bid process, and so they were reviewed yesterday, um, and the discussion has started. So the review was done by Don. It's his RFP. Yeah. Right. Don's a decider. I mean, again, pro or con, the M law, it is what it is for now, and he is the he's the man in charge and makes those calls. And if you remember, just another reminder for those that weren't on the board at the time, Tom, not, this isn't a plus or a minus, but Tom, as my predecessor, didn't sign off on some of those charters and then was challenged and eventually had to. I don't remember if that was a court, mm -hmm. but these, it's somewhat of a perfunctory, although Tom now wants charters, so I Sometimes when I read that, I'm a little, but at that time, wasn't authorizing any charters, and uh, that was challenged, and we we have been directed and have to just, in effect, it's a perfunctory thing. I, I'm a little uncomfortable with that, not because I'm an anti-charter guy. It's more that why even have me involved then if it's perfunctory? But that's something we're still trying to shape out. But for now, a lot of these, yeah, I mean, the emergency manager, in this case, Don, for those of you who don't know, former department member uh, before my time, but a very good, good, thoughtful person, by the way. So I, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not in his shoes, and I don't want to judge that. I, I, I think he's doing what he thought was their only way out, and it seems clever on one level. <laughs> it seems Pandora box opening at another level, and uh, so I think I get the line of, I get the line of reasoning and questioning. Yeah, we had we. And as I said, the irony is the the, the money per child is actually more yeah. than it would have been under the old the old system. So in that sense, of you know, from my point of view as state superintendent, I'm thinking, okay, there's more resources to support these kids in Muskegon Heights than there would have been the other way. And I guess if some lawyers and others have agreed on it, I guess mm -hmm. so be it. Dan, you had one. Uh, three quick questions, and I'll tell you that I feel like this uh, potentially pulls down the rabbit hole because I on a couple of other things with some follow-up questions that are about Muskegon Heights. But um, I, the one question about Muskegon Heights, who is the institutional authorizer for the charters under this situation? Is it the district that actually authorizes the charters? Oh, yes. Okay. Second quick question. Um, so when, under the emergency manager law, is the financial emergency over? Like, what's the process for actually declaring or, you know, who's responsible for that? And is there anything in law, or is it is it something discretionary that actually triggers the end of the financial uh, I have to think back to PA4. Um, it's a treasury question, honestly. It's yeah, at least the same time. What the law says in 1280C, what the law says in 1280C is that um, if the state reform officer sees improvement, it's not defined very well. They recommend it to the state superintendent. No, no, the, no, 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 not, the not the not the academic. They're oh, talking the about the EM. Right. I'm sorry. I think it's unclear at the least, but no. PA4. If they're out of deficit in some way, is, wouldn't that, isn't there a trigger that they're solving again? It's in the law, but I can't remember. 
Well, let's let's try to pull that up, and then another before we leave, we'll try to have some clarity about that. Mm -hmm. Third question. Um, so this is a little bit down the rabbit hole. Uh, it's come up a couple of times um, away from the table, and so I can ask the question offline if, if it would just extend our meeting too long. But at what point does the MBE see applicants, applications for charters that are given to ISDs, university authorizers, and the like? Do, does the MBE ever see those? Or, or when do you get a list of, like, at what point does do charter applicants become visible to the MBE? Maybe is the best question. When they're, Linda, why don't you charter? join us? But it's it's in effect when the state soup is required to assign a number. So it's when a charter has already been given. Right. Yes. And, okay. Right. The authorizer gives the charter and then sends, then the paperwork comes into us. We review it to make sure all the pieces are in place and all the requirements of law have been met, and then we uh, send a letter for Mike to review and sign issuing the, the school code number. Although folks can apply for grant funds, right, um, pursuant to the criteria that we discussed Correct. this morning long before they ever get a charter, is that right? Correct. That, that's to help them through that process, to help them understand what they have to do and hopefully get higher quality applicants going to the authorizers. And you know, I th actually Linda's comment, which I appreciate, is better than is is better than mine about perfunctory. I mean, it's it's perfunctory at my desk. It's not in terms of the department through Linda and her team making sure that they meet the requirements. But it's not a value judgment. If they've met the requirements, you give them the charter. Now, I, you, one would expect, and I have my own opinion, which I'm not going to share here, but I have my own opinion about universities who do a better job than others at that. I mean, I think ultimately the, I wouldn't want to be president of the university that was chartering schools that were, were showing up on a PLA list or weren't doing very well on a top to bottom. This is one reason I've become kind of maybe reluctantly at first, but a supporter of the accountability system the way it is because it applies to all. John could have PLA schools down the road. John could be a deficit district and should be. Not, not, not should be a deficit district, but I mean, should be subject to the same kind of controls that any other district has. So I mean, I think it, it creates kind of a fair play, playing field that everyone's going to be measured. And back to the president, I mean, I have one guy I know fairly well, and I'm thinking, man, I'm not sure I would have authorized that charter from what I know. All right, so we're, we're down down the rabbit hole a little bit. Uh, so I will jump into that space uh, as an advocate for quality education regardless of governance. Um, I, uh, if you are a university engaged in authorizing schools, it seems to me that the business that you're in is making sure that students who graduate from those schools that you've authorized, that you've chartered, are able to be admitted to your school. right? And if you are graduating students from schools that you've authorized uh, who aren't eligible to get into your school, uh, I don't know what you're doing. Just my own personal opinion on the matter. John, please. I just wanna, this is an interesting topic. Thank you, Cassandra. There's so many <laughs> difficult issues which we don't resolve. But just to echo Dan's point, I mean, I've been encouraging. We need, uh, since we didn't get into legislation for charters or cybers, we need um, quality reporting expectations from those authorizers that make it very clear, are they producing uh, graduates who are able to enter their schools ready to go? Uh, and I hope that we'll see some more um, push, and we should make the push, uh, hopefully with the governor's help, for the kind of quality policing reporting that we have to see. But, I mean, this is interesting that these, these many districts, not just Muskegon or Detroit or Muskegon Heights, you know, have these two issues. Either a, they have a deficit. B, they really need to reboot, rebrand, kind of offer schools that are going to attract and keep families and students. And, you know, in Muskegon Heights, it seems like we're seeing one version of a solution. We don't know how it's going to play out. It's not dissimilar from what, you know, going back to this morning, Detroit has to do the same thing. They've got a deficit. I'm not sure how we're dealing with it, but they sort of had to reconstitute a family of schools, both with the emergency manager, Roy Roberts, and now with the EAA which can go statewide to say, here's the reboot, rebranding offering we're making to parents, um, and here's some way to treat the deficit. In the Muskegon Heights case, it's interesting because the local taxpayers are basically paying to reduce the deficit, while we, the other state taxpayers, are paying to educate the kids in Muskegon Heights. 
Um, so we're picking up the bill. We're socializing the cost of their education a bit more across Michigan taxpayers, which is not a bad thing. could be a very good thing. But then the way we're doing it is you have an emergency manager selecting a set of charter operators. I wish every district or every district that before we get to this stage you know, chartered their own schools or reconstituted themselves as a family of attractive choices before someone you know, with unilateral power has to do it for them. But I'm also very concerned with the authorizers they may end up choosing. I mean, the names that were mentioned, um, at least one, does not give very much reassurance because I think if you looked at the quality kickouts, um, you would have pause about whether we're going to see quality from those operators. Um, and that should be more of an expectation we make. If you're going to do this, we need to have operators that have a demonstrated track record or have some expectation they're going to produce quality outcomes. And But to Dan's way down the rabbit hole question, what if they're somehow out of a deficit and Weatherspoon is not in charge anymore? Does the local school board have its powers back? And they may decide immediately to say, we don't like this charter school regime. They'll pull up all those roots and we're back you know, in sort of chaos. So that's a real problem for any durable quality solution for the young people there. But it's it's not a, an uncommon situation for many districts in Michigan. Right, yeah. And some of this, both on the academic and the financial side, there's still some some vagueness, although before I get to Lisa, who has found the, the point there, I would say that I saw Murray starting headlines right away about the socializing <laughs> socialist thing that you were describing there, you know, and we're... <laughs> In yes, PA4, but, I found that the local government that's in receivership essentially is in a financial condition of financial emergency until the emergency manager declares it's rectified in their report to the treasurer. And that report is concurred with by the state treasurer and the SPI, you, if the local government is a school district. They can't declare that until the financial conditions have been addressed and rectified. And to John's question about can then the new board, the, the old board, come in and immediately flip things, the law says before the termination and completion of the emergency manager's term, they adopt, the manager has to adopt and implement a two-year budget including all contractual and employment agreements for the local government commencing with the termination of receivership. After the completion of the emergency manager's term and the termination of receivership, the governing body of the local government shall not amend the two-year budget adopted under subsection one without the approval of the state treasurer and shall not revise any order or ordinance implemented by the emergency manager during his or her term prior to one year after the termination. So there is at least sort of a transition, transition time. Mm -hmm. But ultimately the answer would be yes, there would be a point where they could undo and mm -hmm. unlike and, and, and should be able to do that as any other board could. Um, Richard, please. Um, I was just going to mention too that when a charter is issued, then a uh, board of directors is created is then responsible. Uh, so then a public school district could then um, after the and, and the way the authorizer works with the board which is legally responsible is through the contract. The contract goes for a certain number of years so when the contract is up then the authorizer has the authority to either not renew the contract in which the corporation is dissolved and if it's a public school then all the assets and such go back to the public school. If it's university authorizer, then um, uh, then the charter school is closed, and uh, presumably the assets go to the state, and that's a big mess. It's a big mess. <laughs> uh, it is a big mess. But, and, and I would point out for uh, for those who are concerned with quality in charter schools, uh, a good number of charter schools that have not performed have been closed. We have not had the courage to do that with a non-performing public school district. That's true. That's not. Yeah, there, there have been schools there. Closed. But I just want to, I really appreciate this conversation and I appreciate the, the input everyone has had on this. I just want to reiterate that my initial concern and, and all of these things that we've raised are certainly issues of concern for me. And, and But with this particular one, the issue of concern that I had the most was the fact that it is written in law that charter schools cannot benefit from local property taxes. And in this case, it seems that whichever one of these only two that we're looking at will benefit from local property taxes. So it's taking us down a road that we haven't been before. And that's, that was my 
initial concern when I was looking at this is that we are opening. You want to talk about all this other stuff? I, I would love to talk about all the other stuff, but it is 2.38 now, and if we have the same conversation we've had before, which is essentially where we're going, <laughs> no one's going to no one's gonna change their minds. Well, I think we um, give them all to the EAA now. I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> Do I have a motion? <laughs> No support. He said we had a role in the state board. Um, so I, I mean, that just to reiterate, that is my my initial concern with where we're going here, um, and I'll leave it at that. Um, if there is someone at Treasury or someone that uh, I could have a further conversation with, I can help alleviate. Some I just don't understand how they benefit. They're benefiting because they're getting the entire foundation allowance while someone else is picking up it's the tab for the no tax. different than any other charter school. If, if any other independent charter school were to open up a school in Muskegon, it's no different. But if that were the case, if you were to take Muskegon Heights and just turn it into a charter school, that 18 mil would go away because they wouldn't be able to collect you don't, local that's never, property taxes. That's not true. That's a, that 18 mils would go away. That was approved by the voters. But the voters are no longer in control of the school. They're still voting the property taxes. For something that no longer exists. They could choose not to renew those taxes right. as they came up. But I, I, you know, these are both, these are both. Yeah, we're not going to resolve this today. I, just, I wanted to raise the issue because it's been concerning me. Yeah. I mean, there is a Pandora box issue here. I think if I'm hearing Greg, it's that just like any other charter school, they're getting the FTE. Yeah. However, there is this there yeah. is this mix. I, I happen to think again, maybe more with my just state soup hat on it. If, if there's more resources for these kids who need them, even with some of this stuff aside, it probably ended up being a good thing for maybe the right or wrong reason, because they'll. The, the, the opportunity otherwise in Muskegon was part of their FTE was going to have to be used to pay off the deficit mm -hmm. and now it isn't it's like a in that sense from a kid's point of view it's like a miracle now from a policy point of view can, yeah, well, we, we can no I, I mean I argue the, the money's going but um, no policy point of view I would agree with yeah. you I think we this is why I'm not sure I, that we have an open Pandora's box because I think if I'm a creative local superintendent, in spite of what Greg said, I might be trying to convince my board to take advantage of this. Um, now, that might not be easy because they may not want to give up control, but in the Muskegon Heights case, they did anyway. So, I mean, it's kind of like maybe they knew more than we knew. They gave it up and they have more money coming in for their kids somehow. They're smarter than all the rest of us put together, I guess. I, but I, I, I definitely the see the policy. From the charter no, I didn't. <laughs> I have no, no. Maybe no. that's your concern. Okay, but just do the other headline, <laughs> Murray. Are we good on this? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's not in our. And the question would be what? They believe they have a legal solution to what we've just described. I'm not sure what we would if be they asking could just them to. Provide that to us. So, you know, maybe that could convince me that I'm. I mean, I, I, they don't report to me. I don't know how to say this nicer. I'm not the treasurer. They don't report to me. You're welcome. I, I, this sounded more disrespectful. Thank you. Okay. That concludes my report. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going. We're going. This was good though, because I, I there is tension here, and I think it has interesting potential. But I think, ironically, it has potential maybe to help find some new resources. But we'll see how that sorts out. Why don't people ask me about it and I didn't have the answer? Well, that, neither do I. So quite a few people have answered. You know, people in Detroit were asking about it. And not only Detroit, the whole area. Well, that's what I mean. Again, we, we, I give you, I'm happy to be held accountable for giving you answers or not that we have control of. I just don't have any control of that. <laughs> Item L. Uh, 
um, approval of the State Board of Ed, Michigan Department of Ed goal and reform priorities for 2012-13. We had a great retreat. Appreciate the board's work on this. I think this is the best one ever. And uh, uh, maybe a motion for discussion purposes. Moved by Nancy. Supported. Supported by Dan. Now, any discussion or comments or changes, amendments? There were just a, a couple that Kathy uh, raised uh, to my attention. Others may have some more under, and, and I, I said it earlier, I appreciate this focus and let's get these things done. Um, I, the number one, D uh, suggestion, support comma and remove barriers for every student to clearly say we want to support Thank you, every student and we want to remove barriers to participate in early post-secondary learning was just a, a clarifying um, punctuation, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then a little more substantively, I think Kathy raised, and I can't remember exactly the discussion we had on item three. Um, support barriers. Support, comma, yeah. and barriers. We're not supporting barriers, in <laughs> other words. Yeah. Support and barriers, right. rather um, schizophrenic of us. So item three, G, uh, which was an addition that we discussed. Trying to, I think Kathy raised it, and you can explicate it, Kathy, if you want, but it was basically saying we need to do something more to encourage a strengthen induction and mentoring. And this item said let's seek this authority for monitoring and policing what we've already got. But I think Kathy was uh, raising, did we want to introduce that specific by saying, making G, we want to strengthen induction and mentoring, including seeking legislative authority for this particular. I don't know if that suggest we're, we want, there are more things that we're going to do to strengthen induction and mentoring. I think anything we can do to strengthen induction and mentoring, we should um, try. But that, that was another comment that Kathy raised. So I just wanted to bring those up. And I didn't personally hear from others, but others may have other comments. That sounds good to us. I think yeah. does any board members have any, it makes sense to you're saying regardless of whether we get legislative authority and funding, we still need to do what we can to strengthen. Yeah, yeah. that's that's a sounds like a good amendment. Yeah, and then specifically, we'll also try to get legislative authority and funding in addition to that because some of this is harder to do without without the resources, but. I move we place a comma after support in item 1D, <laughs> and we say strengthen induction and mentoring, uh, including seeking legislative authority under item 3G. Support. support. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. And guests, no, we worked on this for a whole day in a retreat, so this wasn't. That was just the amendment. Oh, that was just the amendment. Okay. Oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I could. <laughs> oh, yeah, those things. Mr. Roberts, whoever he was. Um, then on the original motion. I've already. As amended. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Get up on my hound dog reper repertoire in just a moment with a uh, uh, <laughs> Lisa. Please come on down. I'm Nancy. Then too, it's really a Nancy Lisa. The way we've done this has been great. Uh, actually, I, 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 I hate to do this. I have to leave, and I just wondered if it would be possible to put in this resolution. Sure. Yes. Pleasure of the board. Sound okay? Yeah. yeah. Cool. So um, that. We, uh, at our last board meeting and at, at a previous uh, legislative committee meeting, we talked about the issue of, of uh, school discipline and the, um, zero tolerance. Uh, as a result, uh, thank, thankfully, to Marianne McGuire, she came up with some good language on our um, resolution to address school discipline issues and tackle student outcomes, for which I believe all of us were very supportive of. 
we then were fortunate enough to have some additions uh, added, put into by the department staff that, that I, I'm hopeful will meet everyone's approval. I think this is a really strong statement that clearly tells uh, everyone who reads this and um, is my uh, hope that the district really pays close attention to this, that um, they need to take a look at what their zero tolerance uh, procedures are and other other school suspension and expulsion policies outside the law, outside state law. Uh, how they how they implement those, how they affect students, um, especially based on what we heard today by not, uh, by the three presenters that we had, not only on early childhood but from the EA, EAA, excuse me. And from an Alice and Linda Lincoln in the United States? Rod, Rod Munz. Yes, thank you. Yeah. That um, this critically affects whether or not students drop out of school, whether or not they continue and graduate, whether or not they're successful, whether or not they have the capacity to be successful. And so it is my hope that this board can uh, approve of this, uh, this resolution and that we can get this out to our districts and to the world at large. So much. Moved by Marianne, supported by Kath. Any further discussion? Richard, please. Uh, there is a mounting body of evidence that suggests safety can be maintained and educational outcomes improved by reducing student suspension and expulsion. Um, I, I can answer this at least in part. Um, Hamtramck High School. Uh, took their uh, ARRA money and used it to um, institute a, a program of uh, restorative practices as well as uh, 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 establishing a, a room in their building for uh, in-school suspension. So um, while students may still be suspended, they're not just forced out of the school. And I went there and observed the program. Uh, the students are in a room, and they have uh, two teachers in there, uh, one to help uh, with homework, and uh, the other who uh, serves as a counselor. Um, according to the school, um, the recidivism in that room is very low. And then um, the other aspect of all of this is uh, what they call a circle program, where they, they take the uh, children out, maybe, uh, and, and this actually starts with the eighth uh, graders, and um, they, they have what they call a, a circle group that uh, meets two or three times a week. among themselves with a uh, an adult um, uh, on hand uh, an extra teacher. And they um, go over problems that uh, may be leading to this sort of behavior. So that's um, in the last bullet there the you know, restorative practices. But the big thing is the in-school suspension and um, the cutting back on suspending for the frivolous measures. And that's mainly what this addresses. It, it, it doesn't take away from the fact that uh, when kids come to school with um, weapons that people look the other way. Now, if, if, if I may respond, if you draw a line above the, uh, right in the middle of the paint, the board strongly urges Michigan school districts to take the following action. I support all of that below the line. It's the rationale above the line which gives me problems. And we've talked before about supporting our teachers and so on and so forth, but then we adopt a resolution with a, an inflammatory preface that implies that teachers are, are uh, 
expelling students frivolously and, and doing all these terrible practices, which uh, they ought not be doing. Again, I support the action, but uh, the, the preface of the rationale is Thoughts about that, Nancy, and then Kathleen, and then John. Um, I'd like to respond first of all to your first question, Richard. <coughs> the data. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the restorative uh, justice program out of Michigan State University, they do have national data that shows that the state can be read is actually true. Um, so that does come across there. However, I do understand what your concerns are. I guess what I'd like to know is how would you say that they got the point across that there are too many suspensions and expulsions and thus. We need to make certain that um, we address those issues before they become. Well, I think they are out of control, but I, I, how do we say that? Um. It has come to our attention that uh, uh, some policies, uh, programs have more positive impact than others. Uh, so we can strongly urge the districts to follow that. That's about as weak as <laughs> I just think that we really need to have something with a little more open because otherwise people are just going to read that and say, oh, that's nice, and move on. Well, uh, and this, this, we have reached to reach the crisis. Don't our policies make, suggest, don't our actions make sense? And shouldn't that be the, won't you get buy-in if uh, people say, hmm, that makes sense? because we've already done that, they have. That's my only concern with this. We've gone past the nice buy-in part, and they haven't bought in. And so my concern is then, okay, if they haven't bought in, what do you need? It's, all, it's, it's kind of like on the, the same, um, I don't know what it is. It's, it's, it's similar, not the same, but similar to this morning question I have about a typical education proposal where it says recommends what the case requires. Recommends, there will be those who will look at that and say, yeah, if I had all the resources, I would, and then move on. Requires means I'm going to do something. And that's why I think this, this preface, I'm hoping, and, and I understand your concerns, but I'm hoping that, that by making it strong, that people feel they have to do something. They can't just read it as something nice and informative and now I'll move on. And, and I'm open to any kind of other language. I just don't know what it is that makes people stop and really consider it and do something. You know, I, well, Kathleen and then John, please. Well, Solomon. That was it. Cut the resolution in half. Yes. <laughs> no, no, good. don't cut the resolution in half. 
<laughs> we'll give in to Richard. So that's what Tom was. No. <laughs> I thought, um, I think we need a strong resolution as long as, and I appreciate the leadership in, in supporting that here. Um, if we feel very good that it's based on, on facts that are true, which I, I think we do, I, I, I don't think it, it's not to say, Richard, to your good point, that we're, this is not inflammatory in the sense that we're saying teachers and others aren't coping as best they can. They are. But as Marianne indicated, there are just, with a little training, a little um, uh, attention to how to do better, you can do better. And you can talk about ROI. You know, a little time up front learning how to embed these practices can prevent lots of kids from being shoved out and forgotten about and then ending up, you know, costing us all and costing themselves, you know, their lives, basically, if they're thrown out. So um, as much as I would always like to see a um, language that could get your support, Richard, I don't think we can sort of wordsmith this this down. But also, you know, for, for reasons to do it, isn't, I was here on the radio, isn't some district under a, a big lawsuit right now because they're de facto expelling too many African-American students? Where is that? It was on the NPR this morning. Someone, Eric Holder, someone's going after a major school district because they have... The facts are, why, why are all these African-American kids being expelled at these high numbers? And so, you know, we don't want districts to face that situation, but they should do it because it's, it's going to be the better educational practice. And I think we need to, and I want to thank, I mean, if Liz Bauer were here, um, Mary Ann, thanks for your leadership. There have been lots of folks wanting us to um, try to be more attentive and encouraging and strong on helping districts do better, and I think we should make a strong statement to that effect. Dan. Uh, just really quickly, um, there are a couple articles that I just pulled up here, uh, one from a 2008 issue, September 2008 issue of Educational Leadership, um, another with regard uh, kind of summarizing from the University of Virginia, Curry School of Education, summarizing findings from a Virginia high school safety study that suggests that there is a mounting body of, not suggest, actually um, say, and so I'll read the sentence in this one, if anything, the data indicate that disciplinary removal has negative effects on student outcomes and the learning climate, just as an example. Referenced, not footnoted, but does, I think, speak to Dr. Z's question about the mounting body of evidence and where it is. So I do think that, the, I mean, really quickly, in five minutes, was able to come up with a couple of sources that say the same thing in answer to the question. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. Thanks for the. Thanks for the. And Lisa, now. Good afternoon. Uh, just a couple of brief updates to what's on here. <clears throat> the first is just a sort of a tooting the department's own horn, which is related to the burdensome and obsolete reports thing. It's not a terribly sexy issue, but uh, those bills are moving, and it was based on a lot of work that started with the superintendent. Um, then Education Alliance contributed, a couple of legislators contributed, and we produced a pretty lengthy uh, list of reports for legislators to hopefully repeal or eliminate. Uh, they've gone through and picked out a good chunk of them, uh, mostly the obsolete ones as opposed to current reports that we think that we don't need anymore. Um, and we're hopeful that in the fall they will take up some more. But, that, but uh, these bills do seem to be moving, and um, they're expected to at least pass the House prior to the legislative break. So um, uh, I know we don't toot our horn very much, but that's a big thing for districts is if we can eliminate more of the reports to free up resources for um, student learning. Can I mention, we, we talked about this at leadership team yesterday in some detail because I have to tell you, my seven years here, the single thing I hear the most, and it's frustrating, is all the reports that we require. And this image of bureaucracy, an image of just we're just these jerks that keep requiring. So we did really, Lisa's kind enough to give others credit. She led the, the charge on this. The associations helped a lot. And we didn't get everything we wanted. I mean, we had a load of stuff we thought could be eliminated. And, it, and unfortunately, some of them were even our own that are burdensome. Um, I don't know if I should say that. Well, <laughs> probably shouldn't say this right now, but when the law is passed, I'll say it. No, I'm going to say it now. I mean, this isn't so much a burden, uh, but I've got to now report to the appropriations committees if under this current budget four times a year. That's eight times in order to, in effect, discuss our deficit districts. 
I mean, to me, that's an undue burden on a state superintendent. I'm happy to give a report. Um, I don't know that I should have to make an appearance eight times to do that. And, uh, but, but the reason I'm using some of these examples is when I was in the field, I was guilty of the same thing. That department, why are they doing this and that? So I'm, I want the record to clearly show these are legislative reports. Mo many of them are absolutely necessary, by the way. So this isn't putting everything under federal requirements or other kinds of things. But I, I, I do think it's a matter of the department taking credit through Lisa's work to reduce that burden to local districts a lot. Because it's, as I said, it's the single biggest thing I hear. It's it, all the time, and it's partly a cultural thing. We just all assume, boy, the feds would have fewer reports. So, good work, Lisa. Thanks for that. Thanks, um, Dan. Oh. Well, I, I, so I, yeah, I think this is a big deal. Um, I don't want to underestimate it. I, it's, uh, the kind of change that drives more resources into the classroom as compared to, you know, central office infrastructure and the like, and that's, uh, I mean, anything that drives more resources toward our teachers and students is a good thing. So I, um, I think it is pretty sexy. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> well done. Okay. All right, then. Um, on the accreditation bill, as you know, the accreditation legislation that was introduced initially changed from having a state accreditation system to having the state approve one or more other systems, off the shelf or regional. Um, at the retreat, we had a pretty lengthy conversation about that, if you'll recall, and the board took the position that they'd first they'd rather have the legislature adopt what was sent to them, uh, which was the MSA, Michigan School Accreditation. And second was repeal versus the third option being what the legislation was, which was this um, an outside third party that may not align with all of the accountability pieces that have been worked on um, uh, throughout the department and at this table. And additionally, I know we talked about the fact that the ESEA waiver, um, if that gets through and get, when it gets through and gets approved, um, really eliminates the need for a lot of it because that system creates um, uh, the whole accountability system. And the reason I'm stating all that is I just wanted to note that after um, testimony, uh, including Nancy Danhoff, stating that, I wish she'd been here, um, stating that at the committee talking about the board discussion and whatnot, they did substitute the bill to one that repeals the state system. The bill is expected to pass the House during this last week, and so hopefully in the fall we'll get it all the way through. But I just wanted to note that since there was a pretty hefty discussion at the um, at the retreat. And Sally and her team did a crosswalk, and the the flexibility waiver, when it goes through, does align very well with what would have been. And it's a, it's another burden taken away from locals that have A's and C's and whatever that means. And then over here, colors and you know this is a, this is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah. The accountability is different, yeah. yeah. And then um, I uh, wanted to note that as of this morning, uh, House Education was going to meet this this week on the curriculum bills, and they have since canceled the meeting. I'm hoping that means that these bills are dead at least until the fall, and hopefully dead this session. Um, knock wood. So um, that's all I have for the update from what you have written before you, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, one more thing. I just wanted to thank, and I looked up at Eileen, and I should have said it then. I wanted to thank especially Eileen and Nancy and John, and um, they did a ton of phone calls and outreach to people, and I think a big part of the reason why this hearing was canceled is I think they, the legislature knew all of the people that were going to show up to oppose and said, why are we bothering? Um, I don't know that for a fact, but it, it did seem sort of interesting that this was the hearing that all of these folks were lined up to testify, and the meeting was canceled. So, good job, everyone. Yeah. Dan, <laughs> um, I, so Tiny uh, this, God bless us on this um, on the accreditation piece, I don't. It's like you were sending base, baseball signals to. The, I don't know what you were doing to the legislature, to, <laughs> but it was great. I, this it's been a kind of an ongoing issue. You know, how do we get everything aligned? You know, one kind of system, and I think it was a wonderful uh, kind of, I don't even remember how the conversation happened, but a wonderful alternative to the third party piece is just 
kind of stand everything down because we think we have this solution in the offing. I'm just glad that worked out, one. And two is, since you're up here, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty. I saw that we got an email from Representative uh, Tommy Stallworth um, indicating that uh, he's um, introducing legislation today to encourage the use of alternatives to suspension, require documented efforts to address behavior problems prior to suspension, require referral to community health for behavioral assessment intervention, shortened period of appeal uh, for student suspensions, and require inclusion and review of behavioral assessment in the appeal process. And gives a shout out to you, Lisa, um, and to the School Board Association and uh, Community Health, and wanted to pass that along to all of us. So. Um, it's uh, sent to all of us already, I think. It, it's amazing. You, you, you act at 302, and you have action at 305. It's just amazing. What a group. <laughs> Actually, it looks like he sent it at 1123. Oh. Maybe he beat us to the punch. Well, he, he knew, knew we were acting. He right. knew. He wanted to get all the glory. I'm trying to set this up for Murray in a well different done. way here. Um, Eileen, please. It's like, yeah. Well, I think maybe if we could revive what we sent out to give us all a refresher on that and then think about what the strategy might be to, it's obviously more than sending it out if it's getting that response. Because there is an appropriate use of that, and it should be when appropriate when appropriate, not when inappropriate. So, yes, ma'am. Actually, uh, actually, last week uh, I had an opportunity to be here at Lansing, and I did speak with uh, several representatives, um, Judy Allen, was able to make arrangements where I met with several of them and um, Mary Kay Aki, who's the director for Focus Education for Oakland Schools, she's the executive director. We were able to just share the Oakland Schools story, if you will, for what, what it is that we've been able to do. Personal curriculum didn't come up because people said, well, what if they can't meet this? And they said, well, in the law there is that uh, availability for that. So we, we had, I thought, very positive. And again, I frame all of that with my entire year of just being able to share what's out there. I mean, it was an informational piece that uh, they had maybe not had thought of before. Now, what that impact will be, I don't know, but we were able to demonstrate how we were able to uh, meet the Michigan Merit Curriculum requirements with some of the model that we have at the technical campus that many of you, you know, were able to see when you were there. So I was up in Lansing last week and had an opportunity to do that. Talking to individual Correct. I think it would be a great way to testify before the committee and there's going to be more I'm hoping there won't be, but it is line. a very good a point well taken. Yeah. We'll, right. we'll, we'll tap the Teacher of the Year Emeritus at that time to come back. And be happy to help in any way I can. Sure. Okay. Well, in fact, that I, I, seriously, I think that shout out in your video about Algebra 2 was important because a lot of people saw that. That was within it. That was, as Dr. Z said, that was the MEA side of that, if I remember. Or was that your Mackinac side? Uh, you know, really, what MEA allowed to do, they just really they felt mm -hmm. as an organization they needed to do more, as we all did, just to get the word out on CTE. And so when they approached me to do that piece, I mean, that pretty much was my script. I mean, they hit the camera and rolled it, and then we were able to work through and you know work work with the information that was there. But that was really their point was we got an opportunity now to uh, you know share some of the good things that are happening within the current technical education. 
And um, Nancy Danhoff did text me earlier right after your video and said, we need to talk to the tech folks here to see if we can get that video and get it over to the legislature. So, but for now, maybe we let them yeah. sleeping dogs lie. Yeah. And if they're not. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so we, we need to provide her with whatever technical support she wants. All right, all right. Well, maybe she'll have a unique other way. She did a beautiful opening. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do you hear Mertz? Maybe we'll get to die. The bug lady, remember? Follow on her dad's. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Thanks so much. Consent agenda. Is there support? I move the consent agenda. I guess is there a motion first and then support? Got both. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Comments by board? I know that Paul, by the way, kind of as a quasi board member, has something that you wanted to present, and I thought I'd create the very before I hit the gavel here, give Thank you that you. opportunity. Thank you for doing that. You know, one piece, uh, the morning was such a great celebration, and, and, and uh, this is relatively new. The uh, piece that was in there with the young lady, Amanda Persico. Just want to follow up on what this board has supported and what uh, Superintendent Flanagan has supported in terms of in the fall I was able to be on a PBS special about uh, American Graduate. We talked about the dropout rate in that. Well, that young lady that you saw there was down that path. She basically was at age 17 and restarted high school. And she is now with multiple IT, information technology certificates earned at the technical campus. and. And uh, certainly uh, her uh, schooling at her home school has is, is re-engaged and reinvigorated her. And that scholarship uh, that she was able to receive was from the National Teacher of the Year program where University of Phoenix gave all of us Teachers of the Year an opportunity to change a young person's life. So she is now in a position where that four-year uh, degree that she wants to get in, uh, in uh, information security is going to be a reality and she'll be starting that in the fall. So I thought that She's also now going to be highlighted um, on June 23rd on a PBS special of one of four students uh, for Celebrate graduation. Oh. And so I think that that's going to be a really nice piece. And uh, she was able to be a, uh, a movie star for a day. They followed her around the entire school day. And um, she actually gave a, uh, uh, a speech at her graduation ceremony, which was fantastic. If you could see this young woman grow. Uh, over the two years that she was in our program as well. So I, I wanted to just make mention of that because it really brings everything together of what we're looking at and trying to do. I thought you were giving gifts the way you made it I sound to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I don't mean to be I impolite, but you, you yeah. <laughs> I didn't well, know you were giving a speech. I thought um, you were. So I, I have just a small token of appreciation for this being a wonderful uh, learning opportunity for me. Uh, I really. Uh, I'm so pleased that the State Board of Education and the Department of Ed allows the Teacher of the Year to be here with you. I've learned many, many things, uh, watched many moving parts try to be all moving in the same direction uh, as we do that, and that's not an easy thing to do, so I thank you for all of that. So I'm just going to bring out a, just a small little token of my appreciation for each of you. Oh, that'd be great. That would be great. <laughs> did you get all our sizes, or how did you figure that out? Ring size, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe they. Right. Never mind. We're still on, probably. Three o'clock, I just start <laughs> melting down. Nancy gets to leave. I got to sit here and try to hold it together. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Carried away, I think you'd say. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Wow. This was a challenge given all in this morning, but we made it. Wow, is right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You know, I wouldn't much already be able to wreck the Capitol. Thank you. This was not your job. Personalized. How do you like that? This is yours, okay, great. Great, thank you. Oh, we're still
created a high bar for the next teacher of the year. <laughs> that was nothing. Why? It's good. Hopefully you're not watching, Bobby Joe. You'll feel all this pressure to... No pressure. Thank you, Paul. Very nice to see you. You're awfully hungry over there. It was a great opportunity. Thank you for the chance to... Every year the We'll enjoy them. Enjoy them. We, we don't have very long memories, though. We're losing our memories. That's right. I have the same sensation. This one's better than the one last year. I can't remember who that was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. But Are we good, that, Eileen? Perfect timing. Thank you. It's my Great. Pleasure. So, I'd just Marianne. like to say how much I actually enjoy being across the table from you and um, how much I've enjoyed your constant enthusiasm. Everybody as well. Yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity. But I'll be around. I'll be in the background. If we need you, you'll be there. <laughs> All right. Exactly. We're good. Okay. Flowers. Flowers and lunch. If you eat this same stuff, you'll be passionate and enthusiastic too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little recipe in there, so with that in mind. <laughs> it sounds like you 